Well, this morning I'd like to uh, talk about what's going to happen tomorrow and to the world that is from God's word. There's nothing better than asking the Lord to speak to us. I just remember that the example of uh, the mother and father of Jesus, they were not always good examples as parents. You know, they were religious to begin with because when there was this um, annual festival, there were three annual festivals of the Jewish people coming from Israel that all male were required to come to Jerusalem from all parts of the world. One of that was the Passover, Pentecost was the other one. And so, you know, what happens uh, when, when old people get together, uh, including young people? I've heard, you've heard about the line, young and restless. Well, today, a lot of people are old and still restless. So when they get together with their relatives, they get to talking. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that except for one thing. They were there for official business. Not only official business, they were there for a very important thing. Not just to attend that festival, but they had with them the Son of God. And his name was Jesus. Well, apparently we tend to forget what we have. And we only realize how important it is when we suddenly lose it without any prior notice, such as opportunities. And our children and our fellow church members and the opportunity to come together while we still can. And so as they met with their old friends, old familiar faces, they started talking and talking and talking and talking. And before they knew it, the whole thing was over. It's time to get home. A man head back home. Doesn't last forever. And so, you know, they started to look around for their son. Of all things, they forgot about their son when they got together with their friends. And if you read the account in the Holy Scriptures and the Gospels, which is a lesson that each one of us should remember today, both of the presence of God and the Holy Spirit and the availability of the written word because of the freedom of religion, they started looking for their son, the son of God. They only found him three days after. If you don't ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit today, you will miss it by three days. If you don't shore up your mind and fortify your souls with the truth of God's word today, you will find it difficult for the next three days to recoup what has been lost. It's one day at a time. You lose him one day, you've lost actually three of his actual presence at a minimum. That's what it's teaching us. And I want to convey this to you because we're running out of time. This is the topic I've been studying now with you. We're running out of space. We're running out of opportunity. We've got people that have been dying left and right. The question is not what they died of, but whether they were prepared to die. And all of us will have to face that question today, not tomorrow. You prepare for tomorrow by what you do today, and you prepare to fail tomorrow what you do not do for today. That's just the hard facts of life, and they are biblical. Now, I'd like to begin this because I went through my notes this morning, and I went back to my open letters from Philadelphia dated February 1994, way back in Philadelphia when we were still there. And it is still as good as it is, it was now. That's the, that's the thing about God's word, it never, what does, what, what's, what's one thing about God's word? It's always fresh. 
So I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm speaking in English, so respond in English because I know all of you know English. You wouldn't be American citizens if you weren't, even if you were born in the Philippines, right? Okay. I'll ask this question. What one letter in the English alphabet is common to the following words? This is not a TV program, okay? This is serious business. Here are the following words. Pride, you can write them down. Vanity, lie, liar, beguile, deceive, yield to temptation, disobedience, sin, iniquity, evil, guilt, fig leaves, idols, idolatry, faithlessness, self-righteousness, selfishness, ungodliness, Pharisee, priest, deceiver, minister, that is the false and unfaithful, hypocrisy, hypocrites, image of the beast that is not found in the word Jesus. Do you know what it is? How many of you? Okay, he, she came first, okay? We, ladies first. What, what was it? You are right. You have been paying attention. It is the letter I. You won't find that in the word Jesus. There's something wrong. I'm going to talk about I, me, and my. Oh, my. I, me, and my. It's all at the center of our weakness as human beings. When Satan tempted Eve and Adam, it was not just with the fruit or becoming like God's, it was centering on the person. Pride, you shall be like God's. Plus the additional, the bonus of knowing both good and evil. Watch out for those words. In fact, before you got married, you always talk about the personal pronouns, I, me, and mine. And when you got married, it's supposed to disappear and becomes we and ours. Plural pronouns, inclusive, not exclusive. But nothing has changed much. And by their fruit, she shall know them. Question again, who was it that first used the personal pronoun I? I'm talking about the Bible. And in what manner was it used? It couldn't be God creator, for he did not say, I will create man. Instead, the Bible testifies that God says, let us, plural pronoun, possessive, let us make man in our, not in my, in our image, and after our likeness. That's Genesis 1.26. You know, I is singular, personal pronoun. Ours and ours is a personal, plural pronoun. They too shall be one. And a two, threefold cord is better than two, as it says in the Proverbs. Question, who was it who said, I will ascend to heaven? I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. You better read Isaiah 14 verses 12 to 19. It is written, but know your Bible and know how to use the Bible. Who was it upon God, upon God declared through his prophet? He said, thou sealest up the psalm full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, 
the garden of God. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. That's, by the way, the mystery of iniquity. Read that in Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15. Who was that who said that? Lucifer, who became Satan. Next question, who was it who said, Oh, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself in Genesis 3.10. Who was that who said that? That's Adam. Well, the next question is, who was it who said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? That's Cain, the first murderer. Killed his brother over the issue of worship. Watch that, because that's the issue we're going to be facing today. Revelation 13. Who was it who said, you know, the Philistines, they will come down upon me in Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. By the way, the burnt offering was the most important of the five sacrificial offerings under the Le Levitical system, the burnt offering. You can see First uh, Samuel 13, verse 12, and then 11 to 14. Who was it who said that? I forced myself to offer sacrifices. When you came here to church today, did you have to force yourself, or did you come willingly, voluntarily, and spontaneously by matter of habit and discipline? That's the truth, as it is in Jesus. Anything that you force yourself to do isn't of God. It is of the Antichrist. That's an issue we'll be facing very, very carefully. Don't be watching what's happening in Ukraine and Russia. You watch what's happening in the Supreme Court. Because that's how laws will be decided. And by politics. Who was it who said, is not this the great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Who was it that said that? That's in Daniel 4, 29 to 33. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. You will also see Babylon in the Old Testament. And you will see Babylon the Great in the New Testament. Uh, you have the typical Nebuchadnezzar and the anti-typical Nebuchadnezzar. Question, who was it who said, God, I thank you that I am not as other men are. He's praying. They are extortioners, they're unjust, they're adulterers, or even as this publican here, tax collector, they, yeah, IRS agent that is, because I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Luke 18, 11, and 12. Who was that who said that? Religious leaders, the Pharisees. Those who say, I am more, I am more religious than you are. There's a difference between religi being religious and being spiritual. They are not one and the same. One is a counterfeit of the other. Don't tell people, I am very religious. Ask them, are you spiritual? <laughs> Apparently, they aren't spiritual because they don't talk about religion. Religion never saves you. We were just discussing this early this morning. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is why Peter could say and write under inspiration. He says, be ye therefore holy, for Jesus said, because I am holy. And without holiness, no man can see God. That's sanctification. Well, 
Who was it who said, so let the gods do to me, me? And more also, if I make not thy life as one of them by tomorrow about this time. Oh, scary words, isn't it? First Kings 19 verses 1 to 4. You read those chapters because that's exactly what's going to happen. The one who said that was a woman, but not just a woman. She was royalty, not just royalty, but bad one. Her name was Jezebel, and you'll find Jezebel in Revelation as well. That is what the women church that is wicked will do to God's people. She was speaking to Elijah, the second man translated to heaven without tasting death. And we need the Elijah message today because it's the John Baptist message. It is the third angel's message. It's cry aloud and spare not and show my people their transgressions in the house of Jacob, their sins. And then who is it who says, I am rich? I am rich and increased with goods and I have need of nothing. Read Revelation 3, 17 and the whole chapter on the church of Laodicea. The faithful and true witness, which is the Holy Spirit, says in that same chapter, you said that? Well, I'll tell you the truth. Are you willing to listen to the truth? Set you free from your blindness. It says, thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. That is what the Holy Spirit is revealing to us today. And I thank God for the spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of Jesus. It showed me way back when I was still in Philadelphia writing these studies. She says, that message to the Laodiceans applies to those who do not apply it to themselves. And when I read it, I had to read it again. I saw it in a different light. It says, boom, it hit me right here. I almost collapsed. I said, see, you're thinking I was doing right when that message is for me. If you think you're doing right, so I'm doing nothing wrong. That means you're doing everything right. You better read the Laodicean message. It is the rejection of the Laodicean message that caused the shaking and would lead to the final sifting by the trial of temptation and the trial of persecution, which is coming. Now, let's turn to Revelation 18, verses 1 to 8. This is not the last of the questions we should ask, but this is more than enough for us to proceed on our topic this morning. Let's turn to Revelation 18. It's also a question, but this time I want you to read it for yourself, because this is the last of, of all these questions we should be asking corporately. Because we belong as individuals to a corporate situation, whether it's a family, a church, a nation, a country, whatever it is. And God addresses all levels, inside out, from top to bottom. No one is spared, cry aloud and spare not. God is no respecter of persons. So let's turn to Revelation 18, and we're going to read verses 1 to 8, and you read the rest of the chapter. Because the question I am raising up here at this point to end this questioning, who is it who says that is in the end? And we're living in the time of the end. And the Revelation 10 mighty angel says, time no more. The mystery of God will be finished. The gospel will be finished. The gathering of God's people will be made at this time during the days of the angel leading to the first, the second, third angel's message. Who is it that says in the end, who says in her heart, so God reads the heart. See, he didn't say in words, but her actions speak louder than her words. Who is it that says in her heart, I sit as a queen, that's royalty. I'm no widow, I have husbands. 
It's religious, therefore it's a church claiming Christ as a bridegroom, isn't it? And I shall see no sorrow. Well, that's what she says. What does God say? It's not what you say, it's what he says that matters in the end. Not he said, she said, but what does God say? Again, in any given confrontation and problem, as simple or as complex as they are, there are always three sides. Her side, my side, and God's side. Whose side is it that matters in the end? Only God's side. So let's see in Revelation 18, verses 1 to 8. And after these things, I saw another angel. Oh, we've been talking angels from the beginning. Different kinds of angels, all doing God's appointed work for them, for us. Some are angelic angels, some are human angels, and some are evil angels. We should know the difference between the three. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven. Oh, holy angel, having great power. It's almost like what you read in Revelation chapter 10. And the earth was lightened with his glory. Verse 2 says, and he cried mightily. See that crying now with a loud voice? The same thing. Cry aloud and spare not. In Isaiah. He says, what was he saying with, that, with a strong voice? Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. And has become the habitation of what? What does your Bible say? Devils. Habitation is home. Headquartered. Abode. Residence. Of devils. That Babylon is what is being pointed out here. The habitation of devils. The hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. It's covered all levels now. There's no escaping this. This is judgment. This is a pronouncement made by an angel come down from heaven. And it's upon Babylon the great of the last days. Why? The reason is given. Judgment has been determined and the verdict says why. This is the reason why. For all nations, so nobody can say, I'm not included here. I'm not into religion. You don't have to, but you're still going to be part of that because you're part of the earth and part of one nation. For all nations, says, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Fornication means when two bodies that are never supposed to come together, come together, whether they're human beings or institutions or churches. Fornication. And the kings of the earth, they're also identified elsewhere in the scriptures as the great men of the earth. You know who they are, you read them all the time. You even emulate them. You even idolize some of them. Oh, they're so rich, bloody rich. One become just a little part of it. Give me some. Kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Ha, see that? And the merchants or the businesses of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Does not only apply to men and women relationship, it applies to any agreements you enter into, contracts, business contracts, where you don't share exactly one the same spiritual convictions when a time arrives, when you're faced with a decision whether you're going to accept this contract or not, or get into this business or not, your principles will clash. That's why you're never to get Please understand that. Please. So many heartbreaks, so many broken homes, so many lost lives is because people have not thought about it willingly. But remember what Paul says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. 
for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also what? Reap your right. And it says there, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, this is the last call. There are two temple cleansings at the beginning of Christ's ministry and towards the end. They present the two calls made to the world and to the churches. The second angel's message and this final one, which is sounding now and will reach its climax when the Holy Spirit is poured upon a prepared people to give the final loud cry of the Revelation 18 movement. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. So God has still a people there and it is for this last message and only for them under the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why I want you friends, you in here, to never miss out our study on our Sabbath school. This is all related. There is a purpose. There is a reason. It is for this cause that Paul says, I bow my knees before our God and Savior in thanksgiving and in fear. Awe, that is. It says, come out of her, my people, that you not be partakers of her sins. There are two of this. In sanctification, you partake of the divine nature in your sinful nature. Here in Babylon, you partake of her sins. The first one, you partake of the divine nature, you're sanctified and sealed. In the second one, you partake of the sins of Babylon the Great. What happens? God has what? For her sins have reached what? That have received not her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven. Full. It's a full cup principle. God doesn't, you know, he doesn't come in while the things are still in process. What he wants things to reach their fullest fruition so that there is absolutely no doubt as to how God regards whatever he says is evil is evil. Even the angels didn't realize what rebellion was. Adam and Eve didn't fully realize that they had to trust God, but they did not. And look, look at the results. It says, for our seed have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. The Holy Spirit will bring things to remembrance. So what we're studying today, if you're reading today from your Bible, you pray and ask and seek and knock the Holy Spirit, daily, the daily baptism of the Holy Spirit, to bring these things to remembrance. Because you will have to proclaim this under the power of the Holy Spirit and the loud cry of the fourth angel. This is serious business, man. It's a matter of eternal life and eternal death. Not just eternal life, not just life and death, but eternal life and eternal death. And so what happens? God says, what you sow, you shall reap. Behold, I come with my reward. It's right there. There's a reward waiting for this Babylon the great for what she has done to the nations. He says, for her sins have reached into heaven and then reward her. Verse 6, even as she rewarded you. That's called the golden rule. You expect to do and say things to others and don't expect that to come back to you. You're living in a different continent, man. different planet. It's not reality. That's a lie. And no liars go to heaven. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double. That's what makes me a little concerned here. Not just it for that, it's twice the amount. And double what? Unto her, double. Double unto her, double. According to her works. Oh, in the same way that Jesus says, Behold, I come and my reward is with me to give every man according as his works shall be, so shall it be. 
God is consistent across the board. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is predictable. He doesn't change his mind. What he was with Adam and the court of Adam and Eve, he requires you and me today. Doesn't have double standards. Doesn't move goalposts. Doesn't change horses midstream. How much she had glory, glorified herself. Do you know that? That's why I ask this question. It's all me, my. I, me, my. My glory, my this, my that. That is what her problem is. That was what Satan's problem was. He just read it. Glorified himself. How much she had glorified uh, herself and lived deliciously so much. Wow. Torment and sorrow give her for she had said in her heart. You know, if the law of God is written in your heart and mind, this will never happen to you. If you are a Christian living under the old covenant, this will happen to you. But in new covenant, after this day, saith the Lord, I will put my, my laws into their heart and into their mind. And book of Ezekiel says, a new heart and new spirit and a new mind will I give unto you. And replace that heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Only then is the image of God restored. Don't ever tell a person that a person must act like God because he was created in the image of God. When God says God created man in his image, he was talking about creating man in his image, not animals nor angels. But we lost it on account of sin. And until sin is expelled from the heart and purged by the blood of Christ, we will reflect the image of Satan, not the image of God. You better be clear on this. That's why there's so much confusion going on in our minds and in the world today. Cry aloud, spare not. Show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. That's the message of the Revelation 10 angel, the message of the first and the second and the third angel, especially the message of the fourth angel of Revelation 18. Do you follow, friends? How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously so much, but so much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I see it as a queen that's like Jezebel, the persecuting church. I am no widow and I shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. Why? Praise the Lord. For strong is the Lord God who hath judgeth her. God judges nations. God judges churches. God judges denomination. God judges countries. God judges, judges communities. Remember, you're a light in any place that you are. Whether it's a community, a neighborhood, or a family. Jesus said to his disciples, you are light and the salt of the earth. And you shall be an influence for good a savor of life unto life, or else you become a savor of death unto death. That's why your works to follow them. You see that? Job has long been dead, centuries ago. But there's a man who was called the most meek man in the East, or the, the most perfect man. The book of Job, his life still reverberates today. Long after we have died, and many will be dying, I don't know how soon, but well, long after we have died, our influence would be just like throwing a pebble in the middle of a pond, creating ripples, not knowing how far these ripples will go. The sun has set eight minutes ago and we still see the afterglow. Our works outlive our lives. 
That's why it's the works that will be judged. And then based on the records of God's word. I will go rapidly through this because we have to touch on what will happen tomorrow according to research. It's old research. You'll, you'll find it. If you really want to do research, you will find it. Everything's available today, both good and evil. You choose that which is good. Filter it out because evil is more pleasurable to our fallen nature. And the law of God is enmity against the Holy Spirit. You can't have both of them. One must go. And you'd make the decision as to which goes. The book that I had was The Two Babylons by the Reverend Alexander Hislop. Oh, I, a scholar. You should read his book. From ancient to modern Babylon, from the Babylon of the old to mystery Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth and her daughters, Revelation 17 verses 5 to 7. Do you know who she is? She is revealed in prophecy. But you need the spiritual mind to understand spiritual matters. Because Satan has set about to deceiving people, distracting, deluding. They're going this way, it says turn right, when in fact he switched it, it was supposed to be turned left, so he ended up somewhere else. That's what he has been doing. Here are the two Babylons, and I'm going to number them, some of them, I, this is a long one, but enough for us to be able to reach for tomorrow's event. The word alma mater means virgin mother. You know that? That's from the book. I'm gathering this. That's from the book, page 76. The halo, you see that over the heads of supposedly saints? They come from sun worship. That's the two Babylons, page 87. The trinity of Babylon was Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. The trinity of the Church of Rome is Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. That's the two Babylons, page 89. Candles being used for worship. They're, they were came, they came from Babylon. That's from uh, two Babylon's pages 97, 191 to 197. They're extensively researched, and you have to read that. You'll be you'll not only be informed, you will be educated. Because we need an intellectually and a spiritual mind such that we cannot be moved even if anything and everything that Satan does to his agencies is thrown as a phalanx against us, just like Martin Luther had to stand alone. Moses had to stand alone with the Pharaoh's court. So did Daniel and his three friends. Christmas. Oh boy. Great. I mean, he says, all right, so you're going to deal with that again? I have to, friends. It's cry aloud and spare not. And not pick and choose. Cross the board. December 25 or Christmas Day is celebrated by the whole of Christendom, but it is not biblically founded at all. In fact, like so many of the religious beliefs, doctrines, and practices, it is pagan or heathen and anti-Christian in its origins. It was celebrated a long time before Jesus was even born. It is not an error or coincidence that the actual day of Christ's birth is never ever recorded in the Bible. It was deliberate. For God knew that fallen mankind would use it for the wrong reasons, mainly idolatry and feasting. Partying. Christmas Day or December 25 was celebrated in honor of the greatest of gods in the ancient world. And who what was it? The sun god. I'm coming from the Encyclopedia Britannica, volume 18, article Mithras, the 11th edition, 1911, page 6 to 6, and I quote, Mithraism, an outwardly refined sun worship, 
invaded the Roman Empire in BC 67 and made way for itself by gathering under its wing all the gods of Rome. So that in the middle of the third century AD, Mithraism seemed on the verge of becoming the universal religion. By the word, by the way, the word Catholic, not capital C, but Catholic as itself means universal. That's from Facts of Faith also, page 97. On the book called The Mysteries of Mithras, this was, uh, I got this from the Chicago Open Court Publishing, 1911, two pages, 167, 191. Sunday over which the sun presided was specially holy. The worshipers of Mithra held Sunday sacred and celebrated the birth of the sun, S-U-N, not the sun, but S-U-N, on the 25th of December. Now, since Mithras as the sun god, the unconquered, and the sun that was the loyal star, that religion looked for a king whom it could serve as a representative of Mithras upon the earth. And who did they point to? The Roman emperor. He seemed to be clearly indicated as a true king, but in sharp contrast to Christianity then, Mithraism recognized Caesar. That's the title of the Roman emperors. Recognize, that's not Brother Caesar, by the way, I'm sorry. It's Caesar, the title of the Roman emperors, as the bearer of divine grace. And its votaries or their faithful adherents and worshippers feel the legions of the civil service. Do you, do you hear that? The state-run institutions and services were operated and run by the worshippers of the sun. What a terrible combination. And you are watching that develop rapidly in the coming days. This is what you and I should be studying, researching, and preparing for intellectually and spiritually by the Holy Spirit to the rich work. And focus. Don't get distracted. It had so much acceptance that it was able to impose. Christianity never imposes, it invites. It offers. It gives you the power of choice to accept it willingly, voluntarily, and in time, spontaneously. It was able to impose on the Christian world then, and I would say now, its own Sunday in place of the Sabbath, as the birthday of Jesus. That's the history of Christianity in the light of modern knowledge, chapter three, cited in Religion and Philosophy in 1929. Way back there, we had so much information available, but efforts have been made since then to cover this up and replace it. They've been rewriting the encyclopedias and the dictionaries and the fact sheets go back to where it was. That's why we need the old time religion. Remember that song, give me that old time religion? And what God's servant says, we need today old fashioned mothers and fathers in spiritual Israel. No wonder God warned that his judgments of wrath and divine vengeance will begin in his sanctuary. We read that some time ago in Ezekiel chapter 9. Starting with the so-called ancient men. That's in Ezekiel 9.16. Now, just to close this out, friends. What about Easter? The word Easter can only be read once in the whole New King James Version. And when you get to King James Version, it's just like the word mansion. It's only mentioned once. That means it's not that important. And how much importance we place in it is all imputed by our own interest and focus. The Bible doesn't do that. You see, the word Easter is mentioned only once, and I want you to do research. I'm not going to, that's good for you. But when I look up that word Easter on the King James Version, you know what it was? First of all, I like the King James Version because if the translators 
added it because that was their persuasion at that given time. That's 1611, so that's still within the, the, the Dark Ages, 538, 1798. If they did add something, they were honest enough to italicize it. That means to say, if you read it and you look at the instructions how to study the Greek concordance, it says this, it was, if it is italicized, it was added by the interpreters. But you know what the word was there? If you look at the word of that word Easter mentioned only once in your King James Version, that word is Passover. It's not Easter. That will only come if you're looking for the truth, it will reveal itself. So here, Easter. Originally, it was the spring festival in honor of Iastra, E-A-S-T-R-A, -E or Ostara. And who was Ostara or Iastra? She was the Teutonic goddess of light and spring. As early as the 8th century, the name was transferred by the pagan Anglo-Saxons to the Christian festival designed to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. It's important to know the origin of words and why we celebrate what we're celebrating. We never ask questions. We should inquire and seek and knock and ask. The Holy Spirit will teach us. The other names of Yestra and Ostara are the modern or the modern Easter, okay? Easter is Ishtar. And who is Ishtar? Ishtar was the wife of Tammuz. So I'd like to invite you to, to your Bibles. We will close right here because we don't have all the time in the world. But you can always go back to our, I thank God that JR is here. We can have this on our website. You review it. You, you challenge it, okay? Go to the Bible. Do your research. Don't just say, oh, well, he said it. Don't ever quote me. You go to the Word of God. Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 8. It's about time we did this, friends. This is how they did it in the olden days. They give them, give them peace and safety message. No, no. Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 8, and then um, we will not do as much as we can here, but we should touch on the very important things that are found here, okay? If you found it, you kindly say amen. Okay, now be ready, okay? Put on your seatbelt. We're going for a trip right here. Ezekiel chapter 8. I'm going to read and you verify everything I am sharing with you on your Bible. Okay. Ezekiel chapter 8. And it came to pass in the sixth year, on the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I said, that's Ezekiel, in my house, and the elders, oh, somebody talked about the elders this morning, and the elders of Judah set before me that the hand of the Lord fell there upon me. Now, this is, this is now sacred ground. Then I beheld and lo, a likeness of the appearance of fire from the appearance of his loins, even downward fire, and from his loins, even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. And he put form, the form of an hand and took me by the lock of mine head. And the spirit lifted, that's Holy Spirit right there, lifted me up between the earth and heaven and, and brought me in the vision of God to Jerusalem. Ah, holy city, apparently. To the door of the inner gate that looked towards the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy. I want you to underline that because we're going to study what that image of jealousy is. Which provoked to jealousy. God calls his concern and love for his wife as jealousy. The second commandment. 
And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in plain. So he's in vision. Then said he unto me, Ha, son of man, lift up thine eyes now and wait towards the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way towards the north and behold northward at the gate of the altar this image of jealousy in the entry. This is present truth. He said furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they, what they do? Do you see what they're doing? Even, and this is in Jerusalem. And, and it says, even the great abomination that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary, but turn thee yet again. There's more, he says. Ezekiel, you got to see more. There's more here. Thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked and behold a hole in the wall. <laughs> Have you ever tried peeking to a hole in the wall or to the keyhole? Don't do that. Okay. Those are peeping thumbs. Then said he unto me, son of man, dig now. Right, you're going to go deeper now. Dig now in the wall. And when I dig this wall, behold, there was a door. And he said unto me, go in. That's true the vision. And behold, the wicked abominations that they do here in Jerusalem. So I went in and saw and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall ran about. And there stood before them 70 men. Right. These are the counterfeit of the 70 elders that Jesus raised in this time. And they are of the ancients. Okay. Of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jezaniah the son of Shephan, with every man his censer, all those are the priests in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. They're in an act of worship. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? I can see them. You can't. I'll show them what they're doing. Every man in the chamber of his imagery, I can read their minds. For they say, the Lord does not see, he seeth not. The Lord has forsaken the earth. He hasn't. He said also unto me, now turn ye yet again. I've got to show you more, Ezekiel, son of man. And thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, and which was towards the earth, the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. You better know who this is and what that represents, friends. Okay. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations and days. And this is the greatest one coming up. That's why I want you and I to study this topic very carefully. They have not been discussed publicly, but we must do it. It's time that we're dead. And he brought me into the inner court. Now I've talked about the sanctuary, right? Inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men. Huh. So let's be careful the way we deal with these numbers, okay? 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards where? The east. Have you heard about Easter Sunday worship? Yes, this is what it was. And they worship the sun towards the east. Verse 17, then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Take note of that. That's why we have so much violence happening today. 
with violence, and they have returned to provoke me to anger, and lo, they put the branch to their nose. They go like this, they're making fun of it. Therefore, that's like we read in Revelation 18, therefore will I also deal in fury, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity, and though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, that's a counterfeit loud voice there, yet will I not hear them. You read Ezekiel chapter 9, one of the strangest and scariest the whole chapter, but you should read it in the whole context. It involves everyone here, and as well as all those who say, I have nothing to do with that. You're given an opportunity to understand how God deals with this. So it's up to you to decide, friends. It's mercy. It's love. It's grace. So with that, we still are barely halfway with our study this morning. But I pray to the Lord that we will ask, seek, and knock for the Holy Spirit. For He is being withdrawn already. The fact that you see what's happening to the world is the very evidence that the Holy Spirit is slowly being withdrawn. And he will be fully withdrawn, probation will close upon the earth. My prayer is that before he is withdrawn, we would have received the seal of the living God upon our foreheads. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you gave us this opportunity to study your word. Not as we did before, careless, listless, with no focus. But thank you that the Holy Spirit has led us here. It is a message that John the Baptist gave, that Elijah gave, both to the people of God in those days and in their time and in their dispensation. And in our final generation, all those messages are combined in the first, the second, and third angel's message. Help us to understand it and to apply it and to share it according to the movings of the Holy Spirit that it may produce the desired results and that the end may come earlier. It has been so long delayed if we want Jesus to come. Because he says, I come quickly. It's been taking so long, so much suffering and pain, so much discouragement, so much falling away. Arrest that, Lord. Please have mercy on us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.